So you want to start investing, huh? That's awesome. It's one of the best things that you can do to secure your financial future. But there are so many different investments to choose from, such as real estate, peer-to-peer -peer lending, CDs, general savings accounts, stocks, and bonds, that it's hard to really come to a decision on how to get started. Each investment type carries its own risks and its own expected returns, as well as costs and other perks. All things considered, like I said, it can be difficult to choose which investments are right for you and your situation. And unfortunately, going through all of them in depth would be way too long for a single video, but it is still certainly a topic that's worth touching on. So today, I'm going to be talking about what to expect when investing specifically in the stock market. I'll be analyzing the historical returns of the market to give you a general idea of what you can expect over the short and long term, but we won't just be looking at the ROI of the stock market as we have done in previous videos. Today, we're also going to be looking at how often the market is up and down which seems especially relevant given the recent news surrounding the coronavirus. But anyway, when it is up or down, we'll be taking a look at how big the swing is from month to month, year to year, and of course, over the long term. We'll examine how much your money would have grown over various time periods and with various investing strategies. And finally, we'll be looking at how inflation would have affected that growth over time, so that we can get an idea of how investing in the stock market can affect your buying power. With that out of the way, let's get started. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. So the data we'll be using today is taken from Yahoo Finance's monthly adjusted closing prices for Vanguard's original S&P 500 index fund, ticker symbol VFINX if you want to check it out for yourself. We'll be using the data from January 1980 to the end of 2019, since that'll give us a solid 40-year window to look at, and also we don't know exactly how this coronavirus thing is going to wrap up, so we don't want that skewing the data too much. Obviously, during this window, there were the two crashes in the 2000s, but there was also things like the high inflation rates of the early 1980s, the stock market run-up of the 1990s, and the bull market of the 2010s. So we'll get a good variety of economic situations using this time frame as well. We'll start by looking at how often the market is up and down by looking at its total rolling returns. And just to give us an idea of how the market performs over both short and long-term time frames, we'll be looking at the total rolling returns from every possible monthly, yearly, 3-year, 5-year, 10-year, and 20-year time frames, again from 1980 to 2019. So from 1980 to 2019, there were a total of 479 available months, and of course, the reason it's not 480, because there's no price change from January 1, 1980 to January 1, 1980. There were also 468 available years, 444 three-year periods, 425-year periods, 360 10-year periods, and 240 20-year periods. Looking at the data, we see that the stock market rose in 64% of all available months. So almost two out of three months were at least positive. It rose in 81% of the available years, 87% of the available three-year stretches, 88% of the five-year time frames, 93% of the 10-year periods, and 100% of all 20-year cycles. Breaking it down by decade, we see that the stock market of the 1980s rose in 61% of the available months, 74% of the available years, and 100% of all three, five, and ten year stretches. The 1990s were positive in 68% of all months, 98% of all years, and, just like the 1980s, every single three, five, and ten year time frame was positive. However, the 2000s were not quite as good as the decades that preceded them. This is unsurprising considering that we had two of the top three worst stock market crashes in American history coming in that same decade. However, what is surprising is that for the most part, the decade still performed positively more often than not. It rose in 55% of all monthly and one-year stretches, 61% of all three-year stretches, and 68% of the five-year stretches. It did end the decade about 5% below where it started, but that was mainly because the market was still recovering from the Great Recession of 2008. And as we've seen throughout the 2010s, there was a lot of gas left in that tank. 
because in the 2010s, the stock market grew in 68% of all months, 94% of all years, and again, 100% of the 3, 5, and 10 year timeframes, which is shockingly similar to the 1990s. But while it's all fine and good to look at the data and realize that, at least during this 40 year stretch, you had a roughly 6 out of 10 chance of making money in the stock market in any given month, and an 8 out of 10 chance in any given year, that doesn't necessarily mean much if you were only making 0.01% per month or per year or whatever. Sure, that would be positive, but it wouldn't really move the needle much. So how did the market actually do in terms of growth? Well, over the course of the 40 years, the average monthly total return was 0.95%. The average one-year return was about 11.74%. And over the course of 3, 5, 10, and 20 years, we saw an average total growth of 40%, 74%, 168%, and 609% respectively. I am rounding a bit there, but this suggests that $100 investing during this time would on average grow to about $140 over the course of three years, $174 over the course of five years, $286 in 10 years, and $709 in 20 years. That would equate to average annualized rate of returns of about 11.87% per year for three years, 11.73% per year for five years, 11.1% per year for 10 years, and 10.29% per year for 20 years. Not bad. The median returns do tell a similar but slightly different story. The median monthly returns were 1.24%. The median one-year returns were 13.74%. And then the 3, 5, 10, and 20 year median total returns were 41%, 72%, 173%, and 477% respectively. Once again, I'm rounding a bit there, but that suggests that $100 would have grown to about $141 over 3 years, $172 in 5 years, $273 in 10 years, and $577 in 20 years in a more middle of the road scenario. And that would equate to average annualized returns of about 12.1% per year for 3 years, 11.52% per year for 5 years, 10.57% per year for 10 years, and 9.16% per year for 20 years. Still, pretty darn good if you ask me, but the fact that the 20-year median returns were lower than the average returns suggests that there were more largely positive months and years than there were hugely negative ones. And as it turns out, when you look at the data, that is very much the case. I took a look at the data from a year-over-year -year perspective, i.e. I looked at the adjusted closing price of the Vanguard Index Fund in January of each year and compared it to the January of the previous year to get a yearly return figure. And I split the returns into different categories using 5% intervals between negative 20% and positive 20%. So any returns that fell between 0 and 5%, I put in one category. Those that were greater than 5% but less than 10%, I put in another, and so on and so forth. In doing this, I found that over the 40 years of this sample, the most common return was actually an outlier based on the parameters I used, because 14 of the 40 years had positive returns of over 20%. That's over a third of the entire sample, which means that we have seen, on average, returns of at least 20% once every three years or so. That's pretty crazy. And you know what the second most common outcome was? A 10 to 15% positive return, of which there were 10 in this scenario. Take that in addition to the three years that had positive returns of 15 to 20%, and we see that 27 of the 40 years, about 68% of the time, saw not just a positive return, but a positive return that reached at least double digits. What's more is that there were only nine years, in this sample anyway, that had negative returns of any kind. In other words, there were more years where the market grew by more than 20% than there were years when the market dropped at all. So roughly one out of every four or so years, we saw the market pull back to some degree. Of the nine negative returning years, five were between 0% and negative 5% for the year. Still a negative return, but not one that's going to be backbreaking in most cases. One other return was in the negative 5 to negative 10% range. So in other words, two out of every three down years were only down by single digits. The double digit dropping years were from 2001, where the market fell by 16%, 2002, where it fell by an additional 23%, and of course, 2008, where it fell by 38% by January of 2009. 
And for the record, even if I had done this exercise on a rolling year basis instead of just a static January to January basis, the results would have been pretty proportional to what we just laid out. But anyway, times like 2002 and 2008 are definitely difficult, especially since they're often accompanied by other complications beyond just the drop in the value of our portfolios. But it is always nice to look back and see how they are not the norm, and in fact they're pretty far from it. And even with them, we can still grow quite a sizable nest egg. So let's go back to talking about growth. From 1980 to 2019, $10,000 invested as a lump sum in Vanguard's S&P 500 index fund would have grown to $572,600. That's over 57 times its original value, and brings with it an average annualized return of almost 10.7%. If you had invested $500 a month every month during those 40 years, you would now have a nest egg worth $3,049,300. You would be a multi-millionaire capable of retiring on $10,000 a month today, according to the 4% rule, just by investing that $500 a month. That's pretty impressive if you ask me. If we break it down by decade, $10,000 would have grown to about $33,100 in the 1980s. It would have grown to $51,800 in the 90s, $36,500 in the 2010s, and of course, thanks to the fact that we didn't recover from the Great Recession until about 2012-2013, the investment would have fallen from $10,000 to about $9,400 if it was invested in the 2000s. A $500 a month investment would have grown to $122,000 in the 80s, $152,200 in the 90s, $63,700 in the 2000s, and $121,700 in the 2010s. This time we managed to see some growth in the 2000s, despite the lack of a full recovery at the end of the decade, because we continued to invest $500 a month even during the fall of the market, instead of just investing a lump sum of money near the height of the market, right before experiencing a couple of pretty big crashes. But while all that info is great to have, a few of you might be wondering how inflation affects all these numbers that we've thrown out there so far. And it certainly does have some effect, but as you'll see, the main ideas do stay largely the same. So from a real return perspective, the stock market still rose in 61% of all available months, 77% of all available years, 84% of all three-year stretches, 79% of all five-year time frames, 91% of all 10-year periods, and it was still rising in 100% of all 20-year cycles from 1980 to 2019. Breaking it down by decade, we see that the stock market of the 1980s rose in 56% of all available months, 68% of all available years, and just like before considering inflation, 100% of all 3, 5, and 10 year stretches. The 1990s were positive in 66% of all months, 94% of all years, and again, just like the 80s, every single 3, 5, and 10 year time frame. The 2000s still managed to be positive in 53% of all monthly and yearly time frames, 54% of all three-year stretches, but it did fall to 45% of all five-year time periods. And just like before adding in inflation, the decade did end down a handful of percentage points as we were still working our way out of the Great Recession. The 2010s, however, saw positive growth in 66% of all months, 92% of all years, and 100% of all three, five, and ten year time frames, which again is shockingly similar to the 1990s. The similarities continue when looking at average and median return figures for all these time periods. They are slightly lower, usually by a few percentage points per year when compared to the non-inflation adjusted numbers, but they do remain in the same ballpark as the nominal returns. The average total returns were 0.7%, 9%, 31%, 59%, 154%, and 537% for all monthly 1, 3, 5, 10, and 20 year timeframes respectively. The median total real returns were 0.82% per month, 10.7% per year, 32% for 3 years, 57% for 5 years, 145% for 10 years, and 416% for 20 years. That equates to average real annualized returns of about 9.5%, 9.76%, 9.76% again, and 9.7% for the 3, 5, 10, and 20 year timeframes. 
the real median annualized returns for the same time frames were 9.8%, 9.48%, 9.36%, and 8.55% per year. Over the full 40 years from 1980 to 2019, $10,000 invested as a lump sum would have been worth about $173,203.30 after inflation was accounted for. This equates to a return of about 7.4% after inflation for the full 40-year stretch. And with a consistent $500 a month, it would have been worth $922,384.79 after inflation for an effective return of about 5.9% per year. The diversity of returns does see a small shift downward when adjusted for inflation, as we would expect, but the major themes remain largely the same. The most frequent outcome over these 40 years was real returns of over 20%. Even when adjusted for inflation, we still saw that 11 times. And when put together, we saw an inflation-adjusted double-digit positive return in 20 of the 40 years. The second most common outcome this time was a 5% to 10% positive return after adjusting for inflation, which occurred an additional six times. We saw negative returns when adjusting for inflation a total of 10 times. Of those, four were still between 0 and negative 5% for the year. And despite adjusting for inflation, there were still just two years in which we saw inflation-adjusted returns of negative 20% or worse. Those were again 2002 and 2008. So what can you expect when investing in the stock market? Well, you can expect there to be swings. And from year to year, you can expect a sizable portion of those swings to be of the 10% or more per year variety. Thankfully, most of those swings are going to be a good thing. But once in a while, there will be negative swings as well. While the numerical majority of them will be either in the single digits or low double digits, once in a while, they can be as large as the biggest positive swings you'll see. These moments are where strategies such as diversification becomes crucial. And by diversification, I mean both in terms of your investments and your income. It's important to prepare yourself for that worst case scenario before it comes, if at all possible. Because as we've seen, you can reasonably expect to earn solid returns even after inflation is taken into account despite these occasional large negative swings, unless, as we've seen in previous videos on this channel, you need to sell your investments at the bottom of the market. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.